the Wagas had information on on what this energy can do, and so they utilized it to move themselves into a higher plane of existence. Because that's what we see when we look at the stone walls. They're used for religious purposes. Um, and these monuments, I do think I know where a couple of these monuments are. Was it true that this group of people were coming down to purchase things from local stores and stuff like that? I mean, you know, and why the, why the three things that they were purchasing? Why salt? Why sulfur? And why uh, lard? So, I mean, I have my theories on this, but what do you think? It's a location that's outside of our physical reality. And it there, it does exist. There are beings that are there from what I've seen and felt and interacted with. Were these tall beings that were there, are they immortals? Do we know anything about that? Well, they're they're dimensional. They're like, they exist, they exist in a dimension that is more outside of our idea of time and space. Original native peoples here went with some of them as well. I, it, it's likely that some of them had the choice, the option to go if they wanted to, to move to the other world. Did you and look then, at this other world? Yes. Did you, so yes. what, tell me a little bit about this other world. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Metaphysical Podcast. In our last several episodes, we've been uncovering the strangest, the most mysterious, and the most incredible stories we've possibly ever found about the Mount Shasta area in California. Last time, we went over a 1932 LA Times article that reported a lost civilization of people who were claimed to be Lemurians living there, but they could hide themselves at will and held ceremonies on the mountain, strangely. They were reported to be more elevated spiritually than the townspeople and would trade gold for goods from the community. And OK, this would all sound like a weird story, except for the fact that it was reported over and over in the past. And this 1932 L.A. Times article cited an eminent professor named Edgar Lucien Larkin, who said he saw this civilization with his observatory's telescope. Well, we found a whole lot more since last time. So today. We'll be bringing you our information on Professor Larkin's, John's remote viewing data about what happened and so much more. So join John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's going to be out of this world. And if you're listening to the Metaphysical Podcast or you're watching us on a plat platform, any kind of video platform that's out there, please leave us a five-star rating review. It's going to help us meet, uh, reach more people. Sorry about this. My, my mouth is not working today. You know... If you listen, this is the thing. If you don't subscribe and you don't sign up, you are going to miss out on this five million part series on Maria. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Good recovery and true. This is the craziest exactly. content we've ever produced. Yeah. It, it's like the gift that keeps on giving and the rabbit hole just goes deeper and deeper. And it's like the moment you find something that, well, some of this is not true, you find these other things that, like, wait a second. Yeah. And, and I have to say, this. This has been, this is the stuff this show is made of. This is the reason why we started the Metaphysical Podcast. Exactly. Because there's weird stuff out there for sure, but then tracking it all down and seeing how far down the weird goes and whether there's any truth to it. You know, I can't tell you how many times there's people even spreading things out there about things going on. And when we remote view it, we're like, it's nothing. It's so disappointing right. sometimes, right? Because some of these things have grown to be really big. But then when we find something like this, that we almost keep, there's different players involved. There seems to be confusion about it. And it just keeps getting weirder. This is. That's the I thing. Like when it. you, right. That's like, that's like the whole thing when you get to the volcano areas. Like, like when you get to the volcano areas and start investigating the stories that supposedly occurred around them, they sound outlandish, they sound ridiculous, but you start digging into them and they just get weirder and weirder, not only from the research side, but from the actual remote viewing side. And it's stuff yeah. that you can't discount and see, this is the, this is the, this is the hard part. Okay. So I've been doing this for so long, remote viewing for so long. Um, and it's not from a hobbyist standpoint. It, I am, I am a professional remote viewer. I have worked in the field for a long time, running projects in private for corporations and whomever else out there. And that, agencies. Exactly. So, so that way of doing remote viewing by using multiple remote viewers, by um, having them blind to what they're viewing and then analyzing data, 
that doing that on these things is the same stuff that we did for whomever we were working with. Right. So, so, so to me, while the regular person out there listening to this may think, well, that's just a bunch of crazy talk it's to me, or something, like, right? I would have thought it was crazy talk as well in the past, but we go through these projects and, and, and having dealt so long with, with real world solutions with remote viewing and then place it on top of this, I understand what the data means. And it literally is only me remote viewing it as well as the team and looking at the data and going, okay, this is true. That's it for me. Right. And then you can go investigate from there, but it's, it's, I'm telling you just like, <clears throat> it's just never ending when you get to these places, never yeah. ending. It yeah, goes right. on and on. So it's I've got a lot of weird, weird, weird stuff that we need to talk about. Just to remind everyone about what was in our last episode, right? We had uh, this 1932 LA Times article that we mentioned in the opening <laughs> here. Uh, a people of mystery. Are they remnants of a lost race? Do they possess a fabulous gold treasure? This is an article by Edward Lancer. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> now, Edward Lancer was the one who wrote of seeing Mount Shasta ablaze with a strange reddish green light. From the window of his Oregon bound train. Okay. And he asked the train conductor. We tracked this down. It was the train conductor that he asked. Train conductor gave him very interesting information um, on uh, what was actually going on on Mount Chasta, revealing that there were Lemurians there, etc., leading us to more data in the article outlining a man named the eminent, as they called it in the article, quote, the eminent scientist, Professor Edgar Lucen Larkin, director of the Mount Low Observatory. Now, he saw through his telescope, of which, by the way, there weren't many of these at the time. It's not like there was a telescope everywhere, right? Points his telescope at Shasta during this, I guess, the light rituals, but he sees a village up there. The village has about 600 to 1,000 people going about their business, and uh, you know, he sees that they're doing strange, rit strange rituals get revealed, um, you know, that are happening at certain times of the, of the night and in the morning. All of this just seemed extremely bizarre and even more bizarre that it was revealed in a 1932 LA Times article. Yeah. I mean, just what is going on here? So, you know, John, between last week and this week, uh, okay, you know, actually, before I get into that, other things were mentioned in the article. I just want to make sure I mention this for those of you coming in out of nowhere. I highly recommend you watch the, the watch the last episode if you haven't. But these tall beings from the mountain were claimed to have come down and purchased things in, things in stores that were, um, you know, lard for, I guess, cooking or, or something that they were doing, sulfur and salt. These were things that were precious to them. They would pay more in gold than what these things were worth. And then they would bring them back up to the mountain. There were also... Uh, in the article, it was claimed that that this race, this race, or these these this group of people had dealings with uh, folks in the California area in uh, San Francisco, that they had they had traveled over there. So there is a history here that's being revealed in this article. That's just a very very interesting that it's coming out here. Okay, uh, and so between last week and this week, as I was just saying, I started doing some research naturally on uh, on on Larkin because. I mean, who was this guy, right? And, you know, it's this strange name, Edgar Lucien Larkin. And Lucien and L Lucien, his name keeps getting spelled differently in all of these different reports about him, his middle name specifically. And his middle name is the contentious name because Lucien means light and light, Lucien, very connected to the occult. Let's put it that way. So, you know, is this guy, you know lying is he making this stuff up is he a part of a larger whatever you want to call it you know group uh of individuals that are meeting behind the scenes um you know it's interesting but Lu lucian is very connected to the name lucifer let's just leave it at that okay okay so one thing to note here that's interesting is that he was called the wizard of echo mountain and uh people would gather around him to hear him talk about the cosmos because he's an astronomer right he was the director as i said of the mount low observatory for almost 24 years and he was one of the most cited scientists of his day edgar larkin and jc brown were doing their own thing around the same time in the early 1900s interestingly john 
he was a theosophist. Really? <clears throat> he was a theosophist. That's interesting. Now, now <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You have Helena yeah. Blavatsky talking about Lemurians and he sees them talking about Lemurians. He's seen something through his telescope and he's like, I'd better join in here and start. That's what I was running. thinking. You're looking at early 1900s. He sees some strange things on Mount Shasta. He starts going into the lore of it and it connects up with what a lot of these people are saying. So you might as well join the club, right? Yeah, could be. What but else is there the question to do? is, and this is what I've been burning to ask you, is did Professor Edgar Lucen Larkin see what was claimed in this highly sensational article from 1932? Yes, he did see what he claimed to have seen. We looked at a couple of different angles on him, his reaction, for one thing, on what he was seeing through the telescope. We looked at what he was doing at the time that he claims that he was that he first saw this. Right. So we can line it up like because when we do that type of a tasking, we find if they're doing something different, then they're likely lying. Right. And, and they're likely in the, in, the, in the phase of concocting a story around it, right? right? So, and then we looked at what exactly he saw when he trained his telescope on Mount Shasta. And in all of the data, okay, so for one thing, he was shocked. He was extremely surprised. He was perplexed. He didn't know what he was looking at. And, and the data describing what he was looking at was like, like I have like remote viewing sessions in front of me here anyway. And I'm just like looking through them. Um, he's got this, he's, he's perceiving this light, this very big light and it starts off small and it expands. And when it gets to a certain point of, of brightness, these beings come out of it. They sort of spin out of it, right? They spin. So the light's kind of spinning the being a bunch of beings, loads of beings spin out of it and go into the local environment, okay? And so while they're in the local environment, they're literally just like, like communicating with each other um, and communicating with ships, craft that are in the sky. So there's this like interchange that's going on described in the data between these beings as they come out of this light form on the mountain and communicating with ships that are in the sky and, and, and like making some kind of exchange. So a lot of this had to do with some type of communication, them coming out of, it's a portal. It was literally just a portal that they created on the mountain. But that's that's this reddish greenish light that's being described. Is it is some type of portal? Do you think it's a it's a, it's the it's part of a portal. It's part of a portal, right? So so that's that the origination point is this very bright light, and then for whatever reason it disperses. So. There's a video on of Mount Adams, for instance, where something similar like that uh, blanket of light that happens on Mount Shasta occurs on Mount Adams as well. And we we remote view like what it is that's going on there. And it's the same type of phenomena, the same type of data. There's a portal opening up. And while you can't necessarily see with the naked eye this bright light that's appearing because it seems to be. This is a, a paraphysical, a paranormal type event that is like it, it dips in and out of 3D reality. So there's aspects of it that your eyes can catch and aspects of it that your eyes can't catch. But what he caught with his eyes were the beings that were coming out of it and in and, and kind of forming themselves physically because they are both physical and non-physical. So they're, they are they are moving through dimensions and and. You know, they talk about it being this sort of, um, or he talks about it being this sort of, um, what they're doing a ceremony up there every night uh, because they see the light every night and they see these beings come out of it. And, and it, it, it isn't, I guess you could call it a ceremony from human perspective because, because, because these beings in the data are, they hold this sacredness to them. They hold this sort of, reverent sacredness to them about their environment and everything around it. They're very like with the dad, it's like they're very, very high vibrational, very high bright vibrational beings. And you can't help but like, you know, when you're when you're remote viewing this stuff and you're feeling these types of beings, you feel that energy 
from them that goes up through you because remote viewing, you know, it steps out of all time. And even though something happened in the past, um, when you go to remote view it, you are, are, are literally engaging with it at the moment that it truly happened. So in the 1930s. And so when you remote view this, these beings, they can become aware of others, not that they care because these beings are, are very high, higher vibrational. No, so they're they coming out of this portal up there. And they're doing their thing. They're connecting with other beings that are coming into the area. Uh, they're exchanging information. They're putting a frequency out. You know, part of this is like, and this, you see this happen with other mountains too, like Mount Adams, where these lights show up on the mountain. These beings will come out of them and they will vibe the surrounding area with, with uh, frequencies. So yeah, there you go. Now that light pointing at it. It's just a laser beam. You can see this light forming there on the mountain. Down below that light flashing is likely a car. But you saw that pyramid shaped thing there. That was like really bizarre. Actually, you right. can see it better on your phone than you can here. Right. And now this is very late at night, you guys. So it's hard to get a clear, like this was shot in probably like a, that was a oh, night yeah. vision camera. Night vision right. goggle camera. Right. So so that thing was huge. And that area where that light occurred, because I've researched where the light was happening, is in an area that is um, in the wilderness zone. And that area, no people go to because it's basically just rotten rock with tons of landslide. Then on, that, on that side of the mountain there, you have a lot of gases that are uh, degrading the rock. And really? so- Oh yeah, yeah. It's a very dangerous place to go hiking around. Nobody goes to that place. It's very I didn't very even know dangerous. rocks could degrade, but that makes sense. So if you step on something, it could break and you could fall down or like, Yeah. I mean, stumble. stupidly, I've been all through that area. Um, <laughs> exploring. Like, yeah, exploring that area because of the lights, because a lot of the lights come from that area. There are no roads there. The only road would be like way down at the bottom of the mount, base of the mountain. You're talking like many, many, many miles. So there's no way anything could have lit that up. That's a massive, massive area. So when we look at that too, it, it literally is related to a portal, a gate opening up and beings moving around. And it's like the variability in lights that you see is extensive. Um, and one moment it could be like the side of the mountain lighting up like that. And that's happened more than once. Um, next moment, it could be these pinpoints of light bursting uh, across certain areas of the mountain, but it's literally the same thing every time. Um, beings that are coming out of one area into another area. And, um, you know, is this happening in this dimension? Like it was described at the Mount, yeah. like from, it, from, uh, Luce and Larkin, or is this, or is this like other dimensional stuff? It's this is, this is coming from one dimension to this dimension. So they would be opening a gate up to step through into our dimension to be in our dimension. So there must have been something going on at that time where they were really active. And you see this too with Mount Adams. Like there are periods of time where they, where whatever's like, whatever they're doing, they become very active with it and they're coming in and out for a bit and then they stop for a while. And so my guess is that during that period of time, they were very active coming and going from the mountain at that point in time. So. Yeah. Or, or, or was it these rituals, like some type of ritual thing that was described in a holiday ish kind of, you know, well, you, that's the, the, the thing is, is that if, if you, even if these beings come out and are just walking around a little bit, if you're remote viewing that, or you're, you're tapping into it, like, what are they doing psychically? You're going to get the sense of a ritual no matter what, because they're very, they're always very focused and they're always acting in a very more, I'd say, more divine way, at least with these beings. And so even in the act of walking down the street, you might perceive that as a ritual, right? Because it's the kind of energy that just constantly flows off of them. Right. Right. Gotcha. That's, man, that's crazy. So, so Larkin sees this stuff. Now, if that, if he, see, if he saw this, like, was it true that this group of people were coming down to purchase things from local stores and stuff like that? I mean, you know, and why the why the three things that they were purchasing? Why salt? Why sulfur? And why uh, lard? So 
I mean, I have my theories on this, but what do you think? Well, I, I think during that period of time, there was these beings were having a lot more interaction with the local environment in the 3D physical realm. And, and it's likely that they were like gathering stuff that was needed because when we see needed, like, oh, I don't know why they would need this stuff, to be honest. Like, I didn't see anything in the data that would indicate why they need this stuff. But, but we do see that what they're doing a lot of was communicating with other, other ships that were in the sky around there, right? So we're, we're talking about a variable amount of different types of beings that they were in communication with. And one thing that I know is that a lot of these beings that come from elsewhere will come to the earth for supplies, for water, for uh, food, whatever they need. They'll come for minerals. They'll come here for minerals. And so some of the stuff that we saw was that they were in communication and, and exchanging of like information and exchanging of potentially goods. So these guys could have acted as somewhat as a buffer for, for some of that by, because they looked somewhat human, um, even though they were tall. I mean, we get that in the data. They're very tall, like, very like how tall are we talking? Like nine feet? No, seven? not that tall. I wouldn't say that tall. I would like say like six, feet. seven feet ish in that range. Very tall. They were thin. Um, they were white skinned and they were, I mean, it really, it didn't so much matter what they looked like. They can fit in more or less as humans. It was their energy. It was the energy of these beings that would be extremely palpable. And I would think the most insensitive person would look at them and go, there's something going on with that person's energy, right? And so that that's really what it was. But I think they probably acted as somewhat of a buffer to get materials, to get things for other beings to bring it back to them. I mean, there are many stories in the UFO literature, UFO lore, uh, where where... Which there people are, blow off as being bizarre, by the way, right? right? Just being fake and made up and all of this stuff. Right, right. I mean, there are stories where you've heard from some whistleblowers who even say things like, our organization acts as a go-between at times between aliens, beings who need specific things. Like if some, if they need like a massive order of grain or wheat or water, we arrange that and we act as this go-between so that they don't have to do it themselves and they don't get known, they don't get outed, right? So on top of that, anytime we look at what aliens are doing here, when we get to the more anti-gravity, physical, conventional craft, they're getting materials, they're getting water, they're getting, they're getting food, they're getting grains, they're getting minerals. It's pretty normal. So I think that's what they were doing. They were literally just, just like acting as a go-between in part. These beings on the mountain were acting as a go between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the the next kind of I mean, there's a lot of more questions that we're gonna have to go through to exhaust all of the questions in my mind. But the relationship <laughs> between exhaust them. <laughs> what'd you say? We're not gonna exhaust them. <laughs> yeah, no. So, you know, between like last week. When I'm hearing you describe the relationship between these beings and the locals, it, it sounds very almost elvish to me. Like um, like what we're hearing in The Lord of the Rings, that there was this group of beings that were there, they were more ancient, they were taller, they were more beautiful, they had a higher, almost a higher vibration and energy that's still communicating with humans before they decide to leave. Right. Right. And now we have them or this group on the mountain. And then we've got all of these stories from the area from Lucy Thompson about the Wagas. And Lucy Thompson wrote a book all about Native American lore. Uh, the name of the book, what was the name of the book again? So the, the name of the book is To the American Indian Reminiscences of a Yurok Woman. And um, in this, she outlines the relationship uh, between the natives who had kind of come to this land and the uh, already civ the civilization that was already there, which were which she called the Wagas. They had a very strong relationship together before the Wagas up and decided to leave, which also sounded very elvish. And they described these white, this white race of people, very similar to how you're describing these, uh, you know, alleged Lum Lumerian Lumerians who are there. 
um, that that we have Larkin seeing through his telescope. That's right. that's you know discussing or going down into the into the towns and purchasing things. So what what is there a connection here? What do you think between like the Wagas Lemurians and and Middle Earth elves? First of all, is there a connection between the Wagas and whatever? race is on the mountain conducting the well that's the thing like 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 here's the thing it's like it very well could be i mean it very very well could be so <clears throat> we looked at you know where did the wagas go like what what happened to them where did they 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 told the native peoples at that time <clears throat> that it was time for them to leave and they had to go to the north right so pretty much that, that's all they said. And then they left these stone monuments on top of the mountains in various locations that they can go and wait for them at because at some point they would meet them again. They would come back. So where do they go? Where did they go? So, I mean, that was just really interesting data because, because what we have is that the Wagas had information. They had very old information like books what we would call books on how to do this, on what they did, on how to do this. This this came from a previous time. This was a, like a pre previous civilization, like potentially civilization. Lemurian civilization. Right, or exactly. So so this came from from elsewhere, deep in the past, and and so they had been working for a long period of time to get to a place where they could leave this 3d physical reality because they knew all of the lore all of the stories all of the ancient technology from the past and where it could take them where they could go with it but they also knew that they had to be like of one mind as a culture as a group and to also raise their own internal vibration but the whole culture had to do it so when they left as a culture it was very much like when the elves left middle earth because they're raising their vibration. They're going to another world. Um, and, and so what they did is that they, th now this was very ceremonial. Like what they did was very ceremonial. They went to these locations that had these specific types of cut rock, cut stone. There is a lot of earth energy described like running through these areas. It, 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 it there's, Time and like astrological influences even have to be aligned in a very specific way because we're talking about um, different types of energies that move through the earth when this happened, telluric type energies, electromagnetic type energies. And they had to line a whole bunch of things up. So they had to tell the native peoples of the area that it's time for us to go. The time is coming. It's coming soon because they knew the clock and how to gauge that based off right. of the old information. And they knew where to go too, because some of this stuff was still standing, still around. They went to these locations where there was stone, stone rock that was cut in specific ways. Some were cut into pyramids. Now, if you recall, I've spoken of this in another episode where I knew a person who had found a cut pyramid stone on the side of a river in that area in the area of Mount Shasta, you know, it was like literally like a big piece of granite cut into a pyramid shape. And when we remote viewed that pyramid shape, it was literally like the reason for the construction of it was a portal, a portal, literally a portal, a rock stone portal. So these beings went to these locations like that. They engaged in a ceremony around it. And one by one, one person would step onto the structure and they would become kind of transformed into light. It would like almost shoot them out of their body, but their body would disappear with them at the same time. And, and, and it was one by one where it was like, the dad is describing them as being reborn into a new world, into a higher vibrational world. So, so that's what they did. And what I found really interesting was that some of the data almost describes them as sitting on this stone chair that was cut on top of a mountain. Now, I had seen in this one specific location around Mount Shasta a where chair. there was a stone chair that yeah. was cut on top of this mountain. 
I remember and you I telling believe me. believe it very well could be like where they went to do it in part, because I think they probably went to different locations to do it by, by the end of it. I think they went to a couple of different locations to fully transform every individual that was a Waga. And, and the, you know, the, the other curious thing here too, is that one of the things that we've seen now, we had an episode um, on where we spoke of the mystery walls, the California, the Berkeley yeah. mystery walls. Right. So if it goes into um, Oregon too, right. There's a, all a, the way up to Oregon, yeah. actually all the way through Mount Shasta around Mount Shasta, you have these mystery walls too. Nobody knows who built them and nobody knows how long they've been there. But one thing that we've seen with these walls is that the data always describes them as capturing telluric energy and channeling it, right? And moving it and being able to use it for different things. These almost don't look like mounds, but more just like rock it's piles. Almost, it's like a rock wire. <laughs> if some what of you're telling telling cattle walls, I don't know. We have to get to yeah. this. There's some more specific ones where they spiral up hills and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and and those ones were like a lot of those were specifically meant to capture a telluric energy and to move it. Some of these rocks have like machined holes all the way through them as well, like literal machined holes all the way. And and so one of the things that we've seen was that these walls were also used for spiritual transformation, much like what we see with what the Wagas were doing. And, and so it could be that these, these were ancient, very old remnants of moving that telluric energy. The, the Wagas had information on, on what this energy can do. And so they utilized it to move themselves into a higher plane of existence. Because that's what we see when we look at the stone walls. They're used for religious purposes. Um, and these monuments, I do think I know where a couple of these monuments are, you know. I, I do think I know because it really lined up with a lot of the stuff that I've already seen around Mount Shasta. Really and these, interesting. And these are the monuments that the Native Americans go and and ma maintain, basically, right? They, right? they maintain the areas around right. there and the monuments themselves. Right, right. And do they do they like do they know? I mean, Lucy said that she even went up and fixed some of them. Right. So, yeah, I mean, they must know. They must know, but they keep it a secret. And that's why I'll never reveal where where they are, because I wouldn't want to like betray that. Sure. Have anybody like mess with their heritage like that, because they were very connected to the Wagas. In fact, when we remote viewed the Wagas uh, relationship to the natives, they were like one people, one mind literally like one mind. And I'm sure some of the, the original native peoples here went with some of them as well. I, it, it's likely that some of them had the choice, the option to go if they wanted to, to move to the other world. Did you look at this other world? Yes. Did you, so yes. what, tell me a little bit about this other world. It, well, I would say like the, the like big a, blur. Like a lateral dimensional or like a heightened dimensional plane or something heightened dimensional plane. So a lot of the descriptions of it and even some of the, the, what we call AOLs or analytical overlays. Like when a remote viewer comes to a high level concept about something, the high level concept around this would be Shambhala. So, oh. So what you're saying, what you're what you're looking at here, and what they're saying in the in the data is that this is this is a heavenly type of realm, a higher dimensional heavenly type of realm that's outside of 3D physical reality, but but right. our reality, but very connected to it at the same time. So Shambhala is that mystical land. Um, it really comes from the idea of the uh, the enlightened land that the uh, Buddhists talk about, the Tibetan Buddhists, and and that the main entry Shambhala is is supposedly um, in uh, the Tibet area, I and it's say underground. It's say right, yeah. they say it's underground, and it's like the capital of inner earth as on a higher vibrational plane, right? So that's Shambhala. It's this heavenly realm of enlightenment, and whenever we've looked into Shambhala. I mean, like the Rorix, the whole story of the Rorix and trying to find Shambhala for the United States government around the same time, 1930-ish time frame, right? Um, it's well, interesting. This is, this is why Hitler was obsessed with Tibet too, right? Is right. Like, looking for beings that are in the earth. You know, he, there's all these 
stories about Shambhala, um, you know, different races. And, and he's looking for the Aryan race to, to have powers imbued to him somehow. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The mystical weapons get, get me some of them mystical weapons. And, <laughs> right. and so, so it's that, it's that place, that realm, it's like that realm. Um, and it is, it's very connected to the earth plane, but on a higher, on a higher dimension, not necessarily something physical like people think. Um, and, and so these beings would have moved themselves. They were done. They were done as a, as a group mind in the 3d earth plane. And it was time for them to go because their past had been very deep on the earth side, like very deep, like they had been around a very long time and they were part of the previous cultures could be, could be the idea of Lemurians, right? Because when you get to the idea of mountains, a mountain can as the entry point to the inner earth, to Shambhala, to the, the fabled like um, heavenly world, heavenly lands, it's always around a mountain. And so you've got the Lemurians who are supposedly living in the mountain. Their capital is Telos. Um, it's always the same thing. And, and, and we get them as being in the mountain, but in all mountains, because Shambhala exists in a dimension that beings like that can utilize those locations to come in and out of because of the energy, the amount of energy that those locations have. You know, it's the same as Mount Adams or, or um, any other volcanic mountain where I think these beings can use that energy to come in and out. So you can say that Shambhala is within everywhere, basically in the earth, in the mountains. Uh, it doesn't. So they, they had originally said they were going North. What north. was it? North? Was it North just to go to these monuments and then, you know, basically. Yeah. Like, I always kind of took north to mean up. <laughs> Elevate up. Elevate, yeah. That, it, that's what I always took it to mean. Right. And so right. so the, um, the, the stories surrounding the Lemurians, for instance, coming out of the stone walls, the stone, the, 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 the stone along the Sacramento River, like when you get into some of these stories, that's one of the legends that at a certain point, the Lemurians will come out along the Sacramento River in from the portals in the stone walls. So the, these walls that you are talking about. Well, I mean, that's the story of the Lemurians that like the St. Germain Society has and stuff like that. Right. And so this I think this is probably like channeled information or I'm not sure where the information comes from, um, but that's the story of it. And so. That's not any different than the Wagas from what the Wagas first did, went through these stone portals, used the energy from the stone to the piezoelectric charge or whatever to transform themselves. But they also said that they would come back and meet the natives at the stone monuments that they set up. So it's it's kind of kind of like the same story here, right? And from my perspective, you know, the whole Wagas thing, it, to me, it's legit. It's absolutely legit as far as like what Lucy Thompson said and what our remote viewing data is showing me. Yeah, it's interesting, too, in her book, like we brought this up before, but how close you feel like their relationship was through her book. Right. You can really you get a sense of that, too. It's really interesting. There's this there's this old. There's this feeling that it's almost like the stories that she's telling remember really deeply the relationship here. It's very sad. And, and the right. book has a lot in it. It really does. I mean, this was just one section of this book. Like we're going to have to go through this entire book and look into every part of it because there's just too much here. Right. You know, you know the. And you have that idea, too, that you're bringing up about Middle Earth, the elves and the Wagas leaving or whomever um, it was. The, uh, the, as far as I can see with any data, because I was trying to figure that part out, too. Like, how does that relate? The data seems to relate to this is some kind of subconscious memory in people where, where deep in the collective subconscious this type of information exists where, where other beings left this world to go into a higher realm as a culture. And, and some writers connect into it, 
connect into it and and they believe it to be true because you know a lot of these guys like Tolkien for instance I honestly think that he was so tapped in psychically that he's telling the story of something that happened deep 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 in the past here on earth and 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 he was literally tapping into this story literally tapping into it in a psychic way probably also had information i mean you think of him he probably probably had this type of information as well so well the, the, the allegedly he would get furious when people said that he was making this up and he said no this is from my readings in the oxford library because he was the only guy that could read he was a linguist and he was the only guy that could read these very ancient language language books that were in there and he was transcribing and and putting into words what he was experiencing in his studies right you know so if the if if the native peoples of america for instance if they have this writing in in just a small book that this woman wrote early in the 1900s can you imagine the the stuff out there that we haven't run across that has the same stories because it's got to be out there. But this is the funny thing is that when you get to, when you get to any native culture across the planet, their writings are completely discounted as being myth mythology and not real because it breaks a worldview. It currently breaks some worldview that wants to be kept together. And if we take those things as literal, What's going to happen? I mean, we're actually going to figure things out because from what I've seen, the writings that you can dig up, they take you down a path where you can actually find weird evidence around them, whereas everything else is just a dead end. So I, I honestly, it's like we need to look at look at the ancient writings a lot closer, um, the ones that well, are out there, well, because you're not going to hear anything new. They won't tell you now because it's been. Yeah. And, that, and, that's, and that's what's so frustrating, right? Like the convenient yeah. um, burning of the library of Alexandria, um, the, right. the, these manuscripts in a Tibetan library that were found or not that were found, but that are there that, that, you know, like less than 1% of it's been translated, you know, and right. Tibet. <laughs> Tibet is constantly coming up in these conversations as being a center point for these things. I mean, you know, we're looking at really, we're looking at smart, we're, we're, we're not talking about dumb people here. The, the, like, regardless of whether someone is good or bad, like people are finding they're, they're going to Tibet for a reason. They're, they're finding these stories and they're researching them for a reason. I mean, this 1932 article was so interesting because we were at a point where scientists too were looking into this, whereas now a scientist would just never delve into that. The, the current scientists that are so close-minded on these things would just think it was preposterous. They're atheists for the most part. Of course, you know, if you're not, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just saying for the most part that it's like that. And it would be looked down on to even look into this. You'd be called a quack. The entire thing is just not open for discussion. Whereas back then, well, it was. And Larkin saw something that he couldn't explain. And and it was revealed in this article. So what's going on here? Why are we why have we gone back in time instead of forward in time after these articles were released? I mean, imagine reading that article in 1932. Right. <laughs> well, there was I mean, you know, there were there were other articles coming out at that time, too, that were speaking of fantastical things. Um, it, it, it was a time where the newspaper are the newspapers they weren't coming down on top of this stuff they weren't making fun of it and they would just run with it whatever it was i mean like there are tons of giant articles from that time as well giants yeah. being found giant yes. bones being found all across the united states right i mean you even have like the lizard people of los angeles articles coming out of the la times right which I we're mean, going to be talking about which in we're going to be talking about i mean coming soon to you right <laughs> so so i think that people may have been a bit more open i think i'm not sure um but then you can also argue that it was yellow journalism just to get you know it's clickbait in a sense well and and you know the is that like sure there's 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 some of that there's going to be some of that but then 
it, we're still talking about media companies who have their credibility on the line and they're smart people looking through these things before they run with them. Right. I don't think, I don't think you can, we can just throw something out because a part of something was inaccurate or whatever. If, if 90% of the story is true and 10% is inaccurate, you can't throw the entire baby out with the bathwater. Right. You don't do that. That's not a right. normal thing to do. That's something that has happened recently where be, and a lot of it has to do just, I mean, I don't want to get into this conversation here, but just like the, the quality of people these days is, is just amazing. I mean, you look at how they react to things on social media and stuff. Half of them are sadists that just get off on trolling. And, um, you know, then there's people that just can't, they just, they can't believe that some of this stuff would be true. They have, you know, all kinds of, um, notions and, um, yeah, it's just how, how could it be true? We, we've been told something completely different, you know? Right. We know everything. It can't be true. We would have been told. The authorities would have told us already. And that's the problem. It's relying on somebody to tell you what is and what isn't. It's the problem. Can't Most people can't think for themselves. I don't know. I don't want to get into that. For real. Sure. So, yeah. um, so the Wagas basically elevated and or kind of departed. Now, yeah, and it, it, it was like frequency as well that opened it up, like frequency and sound. It's the same thing. We see it across every single type of stone type portal where it's frequency and sound that opens it up. But but frequency is is also about the frequency of the heart. OK, so they they could not have opened it up if they hadn't have been working on themselves in a heart centered way in general with with yeah. going to this other world. Otherwise, it wouldn't it wouldn't work. It was like the reason why your the body, right couldn't your body find Shambhala be already. Yes, right, yeah. The reason why the Rorix couldn't find Shambhala in our remote viewing data is because they weren't vibrationally pure enough yet, but they were working on it, right? And 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 then you have governments who are like sending them there to try to find Shambhala because you know they want to somehow take control of it. If there is a Shambhala, it's it's like well, that's how a would that ever be allowed? Vibration. Yeah. 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 It's like if it, if if they're high enough to go to that level, you think they're not intelligent enough to know how to right. um, guard right. against like people right. infiltrating th that yeah. pure land or whatever it is. Like, give me a break. I know. I know. And that's, you know, in, in all of my remote viewing, I, I fully believe that Shambhala is a real location in my because it's it's a location that's outside of our physical reality. And it there, it does exist. There are beings that are there from what I've seen and felt and interacted with. So, yeah. So I have a, I have a few theories here. So the, the salt, the, um, the salt, the, the lard and the sulfur. Um, I, I really just think the salt is just for food. I, I really do. I think it's food and, and probably somewhat healing um, abilities. There's also higher like higher things that you can do with salt that maybe they were doing. The lard obviously is for cooking and for for healing because lard has uh, especially grass fed lard from that time back then would have been much better, much more pure and much more healthy for the body. So, um, yep. and of course, you know, that mixed with lard, lard, I mean, salt rather, you know, salt, you need to survive as well, uh, for all kinds of things here in this dimension. The sulfur though is very interesting. Why buy a putrid? Yeah. Smell? Why, what's up with the sulfur? What do you think about that? I think, okay. So I did some research on sulfur and what happens with sulfur when you burn it. Sulfur can actually create similar conditions to the light that we were seeing on the mountain. Oh uh, yeah. It's strange. Like some, some sulfur burns blue, blue or green and some sulfur will burn red or orange, depending on what type of sulfur it is. Right. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm wondering if this substance was very important for them in their ritual, somehow using the sulfur to burn it was the catalyst for something that they were opening up. And we, we don't know. I mean, sulfur is a very, it is a very strange, mysterious substance. And, um, Alchemists were obsessed with sulfur as well. So I, I'm thinking that the sulfur had to do with these rituals that were being conducted. And of course, you know, right. what do I know? No evidence of that, but I'm pretty sure that why else would you buy sulfur? Really? Right, right, right. Yeah, that is kind of weird. I mean, yeah, you're right. It does, it does, it does burn 
make these well, interesting colors. Now, you know, a lot of people will, uh, okay, like, so let's like expand a little bit on this concept because a lot of people will say, oh, uh, you know, hell smells like sulfur. Okay. And so they, they, they equate the smell of sulfur with the smells of hell. Right. Okay. Now what's weird is that when I was doing research on portals to hell, <laughs> um, which is a funny way of saying it, but um, you know, there's been a lot of claims of these throughout history and almost every single one of these portals was always near a volcano and it, there was always a smell of sulfur in the air. So is it that this substance that we're, we don't fully understand provides certain types of conditions mixed with other things that allow for some type of transportation through or around dimensionally? I don't know, but it is odd that this substance keeps coming up anytime. Like I didn't, wasn't even expecting that here for you to tell me that there's this light that occurs and then there's these beings that are actually coming out of this light. There's communication going on uh, about different things, almost like that village that uh, Professor Larkin saw was uh, was some type of uh, uh, airport or something. You know, well, yeah, of... that's yeah, exactly. It's a hub. Yeah. 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 That's strange. I mean, and then, you know, you, you've got them buying like sulfur in bulk, you know, that something was up with that. <laughs> I that would be know, the man. only thing that would produce that weird glow, a gr a reddish green. Yeah, you know what burning weird? it. Yeah, a reddish green green glow is probably the most bizarre way to describe a glow, because red and green are by nature opposites, which right. means the human eye is picking up on something that they can't put their finger on. Right. If you look at the color wheel, red and green are on opposite sides of the spectrum. If you put them together. You get gray. You don't even get you don't even get green or red. So how right. is a reddish green glow that lights up half of the mountain even possible? Unless we're dealing with things that the human eye has a very difficult time understanding how to explain. And the only substance I would know of that could create something like that would be sulfur. You're burning. They need, they, they need a ton of sulfur to create that glow. Yeah. Yeah. But if now, if there, no, if there's other things going on here, right? Like we don't know what their technology is like, what they're doing, why they're doing what they're doing, or how they're creating the conditions for this. They're mixing it with other things potentially that are creating this confusing look to the eye that, uh, like Professor Larkin and so many other people described. Um, right. You know, there there could be other things here, of course, and and if there is a portal opening up, you know they're communicating and potentially bartering with some of these other these other craft that need certain things trading salt trading, right. well, that, trading I mean, that, lard trading sulfur might be something very important for them it, that's the thing is that like even around mount adams like like there's there, there it's the same kind of thing it's like you have different craft come in we've remote viewed these things we've seen like i've literally been standing there at night watching a craft fly over with portholes in it and things looking through the portholes at me and some other people on the ground. Like they were that close to you guys. Yes. That freaking close. Like I have had experiences there where you are literally dealing with like beings that are totally separate, different from each other, flying different type of craft coming from different locations, going to that mountain to gather things, communicate, et cetera, et cetera. Because not only do we see these things, we also remote view what the heck they're doing. It's the same data that we get on Mount Shasta with what Larkin saw. Same stuff. Like this is the kind of thing that's been going on probably for a very, very, very long time here. It's like we're just stepping into it now and trying to understand it more. So I don't know. I mean, you know, my eyes, what's that? What's so interesting about this is think about it. They're coming down into these shops and they're they're giving away gold like it's easy, like they have a lot of it. Like it's not right. even it's it's valuable to us, but it's not as valuable to them as salt, lard, and sulfur. <laughs> no, I mean, really, think about it. Like they, well, 
Look, gold is a difficult substance to 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 get. Okay, but listen so, to this. Yeah. All right. So, for instance, would you would you if you lived in Southern California, for instance, would you I even would never think, ever live in Southern California? Just, <laughs> I grew up there, so it's like <laughs> I'm just kidding. Black tourmaline is everywhere. Black tourmaline that rock. Yeah, rock. it's just a little black rock. It's 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 you know it's everywhere. It's like it's no big deal. It's all over the place. There are aliens that are mining that stuff because they find it extremely valuable for them in some type of like fuel source or engine that they have that they need. It's, it's, okay, so it's a form of coal for them, something that in they can sense, burn. In a sense, right. it is. And and for us, it's like everywhere. And we've seen that on this one particular location in Southern California, they are going crazy over the black tourmaline, trying to get as much as they can of it and Wait, setting up these aliens shop. are. What's that? Yes. These aliens are. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, specific, a specific type of alien. Um, because of certain activity that we've seen, then we remote, we remote view what they're doing there. Literally, it's all, it was all about the black tourmaline on this one particular mountain that they're going after. And so you don't, it's like, and to us, we go, well, what do they, what do they need black tourmaline for? You know, are they making rings? I mean, no, they're not. They use it as some type of fuel source. There's like something that they need from it, that they extract from it, that works with the technology that they have. So when it gets to the sulfur, I mean, maybe maybe that's related. It gets to the salt, you know, maybe that's related. Weird. I think that tourmaline has something to do with their chips. It could, right. There's something going, there might be something going on. I mean, if you look at, okay, crystals, for instance, and how they're used in modern chip technology and stuff like that, even in your iPhone, they're like, that's not that big of a stretch of, of the imagination to know right. whether or not that, you know, to think that this could be useful for, for something like that. That's a really interesting concept you just said. Right, right. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that when humans, after humans have depleted a mine shaft, um, you can have aliens go in and set up shop in those mine shafts and, and doing finer extraction than what we can do of those. And we see that all the time. So any area where there's been a lot of mining going on by humans, you will often have a lot of sightings in those areas, craft going in and out of the ground and stuff, because they're they're they they're doing a more refined mining. It's like the humans broke the surface and they're going in there now and getting more of it than what humans can get. So, mm. yeah, see that quite a bit. Very interesting. So, um, so yeah, like it's it's fascinating that you know they're they have this much gold whoever these folks are right gold very precious substance now it also alludes to there being more gold than we're aware of in the shasta area which we know was the gold rush area um and and they're somehow maybe they just have so much of this stuff that they're you know they're giving it away generously because they have it and and then again it's like these substances I mean, maybe in the past, in the distant past, you know, these groups were taking care of more of these um, communications with whoever it was coming in for some of these substances than our military. And now our military has taken over a lot of that to keep things uh, even more quiet, you know, as these as right. these discussions and things have gone on, especially if this group was meeting with officials in San Francisco during that time. There's still got to be a relationship there that's still covered up. Oh right. yeah, probably. Did you see anything? Uh, did you look into this at all? No, we didn't look at that aspect. We didn't look at that aspect. Um, it, it's it was really bizarre. I mean, hearing about that, reading about that, it's very bizarre. But we didn't look into it because there was no real. It was a hard hard tasking angle. Uh, uh, yeah, but you know, I'm sure it's something. I'll try to like task later on. See now, what we get. Were these tall beings that were there? Are they immortals? Do we know anything about that? Well, they're they're dimensional. They're like they exist. They exist in a dimension that is more outside of our idea of time and space. So it's not that they would be immortal. It's that they can transform themselves. They're just energy, right? They can transform themselves however they want, whenever they want. If they had a physical body that was dependent upon Earth based on an Earth based platform, then they they would have to 
keep that body surviving and likely not be immortal, but they're not earth-based beings. They're not like physical based beings, even though they can manifest physically. So, so these stories of people on Mount Shasta, where they're, they're walking around, they see one of these folks or these people and they, they, they look back and they're gone. This is a thing like that. This, I mean, that's true. Yeah. I, no, I'm sure not in all cases. And a, a lot of these cases could just literally be some kind of like psychic perception because you have to think that, when you get to uh, theosophy and like early theosophy writings, they they often said, like, I went to Egypt or I went to Shambhala or I went to they they don't they they kind of place it as they went there physically when they didn't. They went there psychically. And so some of these things are like psychic visions of beings on the mountain as opposed to a physical, total physical thing that happened. But. As far as Larkin is concerned, that was something coming from another realm into our 3D physical reality. So if you were up there at that time, yeah, you would have seen him physically in front of you. Yeah. So for those of you at home that don't know, we covered this in previous episodes, but theosophy is basically a what has become a religion that uh, Helena Blavatsky had created in the late 18th, uh, 1800s that um, combined a lot of these different secret belief systems and released them into the public through a few books. She was highly engaged in the spiritualist community, um, did a lot of channeling, psychic seances, all of this stuff, was in all over uh, Europe, was in um, New York for a time. And then when the spiritualist movement started to get really exposed for what it was, which was a lot of hoaxes and stuff, she went over to India to set up shop um, for her, you know, religion over there. And she spoke. The reason why she got brought up within all the context of all of these things is she spoke at length about Lemuria in her in uh, the Secret Doctrine and some of her other writings. And we're trying to determine uh, now. If you watch our episodes, I, I'm still of the belief that Helena Blavatsky was a con artist. I really think that. I mean, she there's just too much about her that was just that smelled funny. I mean, even her own people didn't like her. The psychic societies at the time said she was a she was a fraud. Yeah, you know, and and she just every step of the way she seems to be like conning people. However, that doesn't mean that guys like Larkin weren't le weren't legit i mean and there are other ties here that we haven't even started getting into which is when you start looking into a lot of these folks the the, the masons and the rosicrucians really start coming up more and more right um i mean they we're 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 talking about to this day rosicrucians and and the masons still talk about these subjects like mm -hmm. passionately yeah, they do. And yeah, and do. and and it's possible that Blavatsky went rogue off of one of these and revealed a lot of this information, probably much to their dismay. But now she has kind of taken on a, a lot of her own clout in these different circles that right. they still reference her in a really bizarre way, even though she was like, honestly, it's like, you know, no one would want to hang around that woman. Right, right. I mean, every time I see that picture of her, I, I feel like she's just trying to stare me down. Gosh, man. No, what, like, yeah, Lindsay, no, you don't have to think to, <laughs> Honestly, she's like, looking I, at you. Yeah, I don't even like. And she's like, unhappy. It's like one of these people like that want you to believe they're more powerful than they are kind of feeling. Yeah, it's power, power over yeah. others. It's like, oh, come on. I know. I know. I, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, too. I think that I think that 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 she was probably, uh, you know, the snake oil uh, to a large degree. Salesman. Yeah. When you get into when you get into a lot of this stuff and like the later things, though, there's there like um, the dweller on two worlds. I think it was with the uh, the fellow that wrote the book about Mount Shasta and Lemurians in it. And then you have people yeah. like. Um, Francis Spencer Oliver was his Francis name, by the way. Yeah. Spencer Oliver. Then you have 
um, other people who were part of theosophy that were bringing psychic information <clears throat> and talking about different locations, like it's, it's, it's sort of off, like the information is sort of off, but it's like the smoke of a fire, right? It, it, you're looking at the smoke as being the fire. It's coming from something. It's coming from some reality, but it's not 100% what the reality is. And that's what we've seen over and over with a lot of the stuff. Well, it, it's really interesting because they can be leads. The stuff that people channel in that from that time can be leads to some other strange, deeper physical side of it that's real, right? That isn't exactly what they're saying, but there's there's some strange reality to it. It's like the Wagas, the Lemurians, the coming in and out of the stone portals. Which one is it? Well, it's like, and the giants going to live underground and people going to live underground, like, like during that time frame to escape a cataclysm, like, like which story is it? It isn't one or the other. It's, it's like this whole thing that happened with probably a lot of different cultures, a lot of different people, and it's being consolidated into one thing. And so people were just be arguing about the Lemurians. Well, there's no Lemurians because there was no Lemuria. Right? And so it's kind of like arguing about Atlantis. Atlantis didn't exist. It doesn't matter. There's stuff under the ocean that proves there were ancient civilizations that are very, very old that, that could be or couldn't be Atlantis. Who cares? There are beings that went through these stone portals that could be Lemurians or not Lemurians. Who cares? It doesn't matter because something did happen, right? Yeah, and it's it's funny. It's like even in our own time over the last 200, 300 years, there's barely any evidence that Tartaria existed, save for a few <laughs> maps and all of this stuff. And right. yet everyone will look one another in the eye and be like, pass the tartar sauce, please. And you're like, well, where did that <laughs> right. come from? Right. It's like even in our own time, we can lose sight of an entire civilization that existed that expanded across all of Russia. Right. Right. And, 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 and you're telling me we're going to remember or know about any of the ancient. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here is this is a thought experiment. This entire exactly. show is to yeah. discuss these things openly and to try to figure out what's going on and, and shed some light on it, because, you know, there is some tr there's definitely falsehoods involved here and there's truth. And I mean, we're going to be getting more into that, especially when we start talking about St. Germain around here. I mean, we haven't even started on that entire rabbit hole and that is some of the most bizarre stuff that that ends up wrapping around a lot of other concepts that everyone's excitedly talking about with this this strange reptilian race that seems to live uh in that mount shasta area like what's up with that um and yeah and i mean and we have all of these Rosicrucians and Masons who are, you know, like these people that are in the Rosicrucians and the Masons are usually high society folks. They don't come out and talk about the stuff that they actually believe. Right. But they're a part of this, these groups and these groups believe in Lemuria. I mean, on, on Ros Rosicrucian.org, there's a page from their list of Rosicrucian books with a description <laughs> of the 1931 book, Lemuria, The Lost Content of the Pacific, this guy named uh, Wishor Serve and a guy named James Ward, not to be confused with James Church Ward, who's a totally different guy, by the way. You know, and and this guy, Wishor Serve, he, that was the pen name for this guy, uh, Harvey Spencer Lewis, who was trying to cover up, like what we just said, like sometimes these people will publish books and they'll cover up their real name because they don't want to be known as the woo woo guy that came out with this book, but they're still right. highly interested in it. Right. So, and Harvey Spencer Lewis, he was an occultist um, who first founded the Rosicrucian order in the United States after being initiated in France, which is its own rabbit hole that I could go into that I'm not going to right now. And um, the Rosicrucians consider his writings to be mystical sources that they should all read. Well, this topic actually gets so weird that we had to keep going and going on this research until we brought you all the information we could find that nobody else is talking about. So you won't want to miss a lot more that's coming. Thanks for being with us today for another metaphysical podcast. And we hope that you thought this show was as out of this world as we did.